All right, welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jerry Kaplan. He's a cereal entrepreneur. I'm not sure what flavor is cereal, but some flavor. And uh, <coughs> co-founded four Silicon Valley startups, two of which became public traded companies. He's also written, I, and I don't quite understand this. I hope you explain a best-selling nonfiction novel. Yep. Okay, <laughs> called Startup Silicon Valley Adventure, selected as Business Week for one of the uh, top 10 business books of the year. And his latest book, he's gonna talk with us today about Humans Need Not Apply, A Guide to Wealth and Work in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. He's now teaching at Stanford in um, Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, teaches on the ethics and impact of artificial intelligence and computer science. Okay, just so I can calibrate to the audience, how many people here are engineers? Can you raise your hands? Excellent, okay, and how, how many people on the live stream? <laughs> they can't see me either, I discovered. They just see the slides. So the fact that I'm standing here buck naked is invisible <laughs> to all of those people. See what, see what you missed? You, they're, they're the lucky ones that, that didn't come. Okay, I'm going to talk today about artificial intelligence. How many of you are do work that is in or related to the field of artificial intelligence. Excellent. I hope that I'm going to give you a new way to think about that. Now, the common wisdom about artificial intelligence is that we're building increasingly intelligent machines that are ultimately going to surpass human capabilities. Uh, they're going to steal our jobs and possibly even escape human control and take over the world. Well, I'm going to present the case today that this standard narrative is both misguided and it's counterproductive. I think that a more appropriate framing of the field, which is actually better supported by historical events and current events, is that artificial intelligence is simply a natural extension of long-standing efforts to automate tasks. And that this dates back uh, to the start of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the consequences of thinking of the field in this different way rather than the way that it's typically done. So let me start with this. What is artificial intelligence really? Can machines really think? Now I want to tell you something. After a lifetime of work in this field and a great deal of reflection on this question, my uh, reluctant and disappointing answer is very simple. The answer is no. Uh, or at least I agree with Alan Turing uh, in his conclusion of his 1950 paper where he uh, talked about, proposed the Turing test. He didn't call it the Turing test. You guys, how many people, have, uh, everybody's familiar with the Turing test? Great, great, great. Um, by the way, if you read the paper, it isn't what the public thinks the Turing test really is, a test of intelligence. Not what he says, that's not what it's about. What he said was, I believe the question, can machines think? to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. That's actually what he said in the paper. Uh, now, at best, I think, they don't think the way people think. And it's a little more than an analogy to say that they really think at all. Because machines are not people. And there's simply no persuasive evidence that machines are on a path to becoming generally intelligent, sentient beings, uh, despite what everybody sees in the movies. Now, you might say, my straw engineer. But wait a minute. Can't they solve all sorts of complex reasoning and perception problems? My answer is sure. They can perform tasks that humans use intelligence to solve. But that doesn't mean that the machines themselves are intelligent. It only means that a lot of tasks that we thought required general intelligence are really subject to a solution by other more mechanical means. Now, there's an old joke in AI. I'd like to know how many of you heard this. Uh, that once the problem is solved, it's no longer considered AI. OK, remember that? Uh, well, I, personally, I no longer think that's a joke. And I'm going to take a look at some of the signature accomplishments of artificial intelligence from this new and different perspective. So let's start with chess. For decades, the archetypal test of coming of age of artificial intelligence was whether a machine could ever beat the world's chess champion. Now, many of you may not have been engineers at that time, but I lived through this. Uh, for a long time, chess was considered the quintessential demonstration of human intelligence. Surely, people thought, when a computer could beat the world's champion at chess, 
artificial intelligence had arrived. It was, it was the singularity. Well, it happened in 1997 when IBM's uh, Deep Blue beat the then world champion Gary Kasparov. And all kinds of ink was spilled in the media. They did have ink back then. Um, lamenting the arrival of super intelligent machines. And there was all kinds of hand wringing over what this accomplishment meant for the future of humankind. But the truth is it meant nothing other than that you could do a lot of clever programming and use the increased speed of computers to play chess. That's all it meant. Now the techniques that were used certainly have application to other classes of problems, but, they, but it hardly proved to be the harbinger of the robot apocalypse that everybody had expected. So people said, okay, okay, you know, the world didn't end that day. Well, how about this other day? I said, computers can play chess. That's a limited, well-defined domain, but they'll never be able to drive a car. Okay, that requires a broad understanding of the real world, the ability to make split-second judgments in chaotic circumstances, and it requires common sense. Well, as you know, this uh, bulwark of human supremacy was breached in 2004, notably in 2004 with the DARPA Grand Challenge uh, that um, Sebastian Thrun, you guys probably know Sebastian, was in charge of that project. Uh, but our self-driving cars do just that. They drive cars. They don't build houses. They don't cook meals. They don't make beds. They drive cars. So now we speak of autonomous vehicles, but here's the problem. What that means to an engineer is very different than what it means to the general public. These are two different things. The public discourse is dangerously disconnected from the, the academic or technical discourse. To an engineer, it means that data from sensors can be synthesized and analyzed to formulate uh, control instructions that are sent to effectors like brakes and steering. But to your mother, to the general public, it means that the car is looking around. It's figuring out what it's seeing. It's understanding. And then it's deciding what it's going to do next. Now, these two descriptions are fundamentally different. Uh, you guys know, anybody here know Brad Templeton? No? OK. He's, he worked here on the Google Car Project. Uh, he's at uh, Singularity University. So he had a great quote. He said, your car will truly be autonomous when you instruct it to take you to the office, but it decides to go to the beach instead. <laughs> OK, so computers can play chess, and computers can drive cars, but they moved the goalpost again. They could never play Jeopardy. That requires too much world knowledge, understanding metaphors, and clever wordplay. Well, thanks again to the ingenious people at IBM, this hurdle has also been cleared, as you know. Uh, IBM's uh, Watson system beat Ken Jennings, the world's champion. That was 2011. Now, what is Watson? The reality is it's a collection of facts and figures that are encoded into cleverly organized modules that can quickly and accurately answer various types of common Jeopardy questions. Watson's main advantage, most people don't know, uh, was that it could ring in before the other contestants uh, when it thought it had a high probability of a correct answer. You know, don't fight with a machine that can hit a button in a millisecond. Now, it's a, it's a remarkable and very sophisticated knowledge base retrieval and inference system. And it was honed, at least at that time, to a very particular problem set. Now they're trying to apply it to other problem sets. But I'm going to take a little aside in my talk and rant here for a minute. Um, there's some issues that Watson, as it was presented, raises that really disturb me. Uh, more than you may think, Watson's Jeopardy victory was something of a magic show. And in my opinion, there's way too much of this sort of gratuitous anthropomorphism in artificial intelligence. IBM didn't do the field any favors, in my view, by wrapping Watson in a theatrical suite of anthropomorphic features. There's no technical reason to have the system say its responses in a calm, didactic tone of voice, and uh, it had this head-like swirling graphics suggesting that the machine has a mind and that it's thinking about the problem, much less to set it right next to the two other players that way, if you've, if you've seen how they did that. Um, these are really incidental adornments to what is otherwise a tremendous technical achievement, but without a deep understanding of how these systems work, and with humans as the only available exemplars with which to interpret the results, the temptation for the average person 
To view these systems as human-like is absolutely irresistible, but they're not. Uh, robots don't have independent goals and desires. A robot that's designed to wash and fold laundry may be plenty sophisticated. It might learn not to put the laundry away when you're sleeping or uh, determine how you like your shirts folded. It can be very sophisticated, but it isn't going to wake up one day and say, oh my god, what a fool I've been. I really want to play the great concert halls of Vienna. <laughs> not going to happen. So just as we can teach bears to ride bikes, and we can teach chimps to use sign language, we can build machines that perform tasks somewhat the way people do. And we can even simulate human emotions. We can make them say, ouch, when you pinch them, or wag their tails when you pet them. But there's simply no compelling reason to believe that this bears any meaningful relation to human behavior or experience. Machines aren't people, even if we build them to talk and to walk and to chew gum like we do. OK, let me get back, end of rant, let me get back to my examples. <coughs> Who is doing machine learning here? Maya is. OK, good. Um, so maybe Watson isn't the holy grail, but what about machine learning systems? Aren't they more like human intelligence? The answer is not really. In reality, the use of these anthropomorphic terms like deep learning and neural networks is really little more than an analogy. In the same sense that like airplane wings uh, were, designed, were inspired by, by birds. Consider how machines and people learn. You can teach a computer to recognize cats whoops, by showing it a million images, as Andrew Eng did. You guys know Andrew? Good, OK. Uh, I gave him this talk, by the way. I don't know how happy he was to hear my point of view. Um, you can do this by showing uh, a machine a million images of cats, or you can simply point one out to a three-year-old and get the same job done. That's a cat. <gasps> and now they know what a cat is. Obviously, humans and machines do not learn the same way. Let me give you another example. Anybody here working on machine translation? Nobody. Oh my god. OK. Um, tremendous strides have been made in this field, as you probably know, in the past few years, mainly by applying statistical machine learning techniques to very large bodies of concorded texts. But how do people perform this difficult task? They learn two or more languages, uh, along with the respective cultures and conventions. And then they read some text in one language. They understand what it says. And then they render the meaning as closely as they can in the other language. But machine translation, as successful as it is today, bears almost no relationship to the human translation process. It simply means there's another way to approximate the same results using a machine. Well, now we carry around a smartphone. Uh, it's sort of reminiscent of the capabilities of the, uh, the computer on the Star Trek's Enterprise, or maybe even the HAL 9000, hopefully minus the uh, homicidal intent. <laughs> uh, what is it? Google. What was the term? Hey, Google Voice? OK, Google. OK, Google. OK, Google. Sorry. OK, Google. Uh, you, know, you can talk to your phone, and it talks back. And it becomes more capable every day as you download new apps and you upgrade the operating system. But do you really think of your phone as getting smarter in this human sense when you download an app or you enable the voice recognition? Certainly not in the same sense that you get smarter when you learn uh, calculus or you learn philosophy. It's the electronic equivalent of a Swiss army knife. It's a bunch of different information processing tools bound together into a single unit that take advantage of some commonalities like detailed maps or like internet access. You have one integrated mind. Your phone has no mind at all, no one's home. OK, so what is intelligence? Let me go on to this. So machines perform an increasingly diverse array of tasks that people perform by applying their native intelligence. Does that mean the machines are smart? Let's look at how we might measure supposed machine intelligence. 
Now, I pulled this image off the internet. I did not make this slide. I'm <laughs> illustrating a point with it. We can start by looking at how humans measure intelligence. And of course, one very common way is with IQ tests. But even for humans, this is an ex extremely flawed concept. We love to measure and rank things with numbers. But let's face it, reducing human intelligence to a flat linear scale is highly questionable. Little Sally did two more arithmetic problems than Johnny in the time that was allotted. So her IQ is seven points higher than his. Bull. This is not to say that some people aren't smarter than others, only that simple linear numerical measures provide an inappropriate patina of objectivity and precision. As psychologists are fond of pointing out, there are many different kinds of intelligence, social, emotional, athlete, analytic, athletic, musical, etc. What does it mean here to say that Mozart and Einstein have the same IQ? Now, suppose we gave the same IQ test to a machine, that, that we, the same ones we administer to humans. After all, how else are we going to measure their IQs? Well, it took only one millisecond to accurately complete the same sums that took Sally and Johnny an hour. That machine must be super smart. Well, as you may know, calculating, some people don't know this. It's a really cool fact. Calculating used to be the province of highly trained specialists, and they were known as calculators. It was a profession. The profession required considerable intelligence, attention to detail, and skill. Uh, now all it takes is a 99 cent calculator. Oh my god, the robots can outperform us. They're super smart on measures that we use for human intelligence. What are we going to do when they decide they don't need us anymore and they're going to take over? OK. You're probably wondering how I'm going to tie this slide <laughs> into my talk. I'll give it a try. The truth is that intelligence isn't an objective, well-defined, measurable attribute like mass or blood pressure. It's a subjective, culturally influenced concept that's more like beauty. Who's more attractive, Angelina Jolie or January Jones? Is the answer the same in Nairobi or in Karachi? Uh, can you say that one is 6.5% more attractive than the other? Is that a meaningful thing to say? Now, let's apply this observation to the super intelligence debate, which hopefully many of you have heard. Uh, there's a book by Nick Bostrom. Anybody heard of that book? A couple of people, OK. I'm going after him in a talk next week. It's not going to be good. <laughs> uh, let's apply this same thinking to the super intelligence debate. As anybody can see from the movies, here it is, female robots are getting more attractive and more capable all the time. <laughs> if I were to subscribe to a concept like super intelligence, I could write a scholarly tome about how uh, robots are becoming more beautiful. And I could, I don't know, maybe I could call it like super attractiveness or something. And I could conclude that this is an existential threat to humanity. Because when female robots begin to exceed human attractiveness, men will only desire to mate with them instead of other people. And that's going to disrupt our natural reproductive process. OK. that's. The same argument that you find in superintelligence played out in a different domain. Now, here's a news flash for you guys. There's no such thing as a female or a male robot, despite what the average moviegoer is encouraged to believe. And just like there's no such thing as a generally intelligent robot. That's a comparable slice of fiction. Now, we might want to create such a thing, but a sober look at the results so far don't suggest at all that we're on the path to doing so. It's a little bit like climbing a tree and claiming progress on getting to the moon. Now, there's a long and undistinguished history of false alarms in artificial intelligence predicting the imminent emergence of generally intelligent machines. Anybody here know what a perceptron is? I, I took this out of the talk, but you've got to be older than it's interesting. <laughs> the hand, old, the gray hair is hands gone. This was the beginning of neural networks. Very interesting story. But remember perceptrons? You guys may not have heard of symbolic systems, uh, general problem solvers, connection machines. Anybody remember the connection machine that was going to take over the world? Uh, scripts, frames, expert systems, 
Who lived through that debacle? I did. I was in one of those companies. A case-based reasoning, Doug Lennett's work at Psych. You guys heard of that? The fifth generation computers and Lisp machines, they were going to take over the world. Luckily, most of these have been forgotten. So are the robots taking over? Well, by the superintelligence logic, the machines took over a long time ago, whether they were smart or not. Uh, they move our freight, they score our tests, they explore the cosmos, they handle our billing, they plant and pick most of our crops, they trade stocks, they store and retrieve our documents, they manufacture just about everything, including themselves, sometimes with human help, sometimes without human intervention. All these ta are tasks that not long ago would have been regarded as requiring human effort and intelligence. And yet, the often predicted demise of human labor never arrived. And nor have the machines taken over. The robots are doing these things, but they're not taking over our businesses. They're not marrying our children. And uh, they're not watching the sci-fi channel when you're not home. That's not what's going on. So what's wrong with the traditional picture of AI? We can build machines and write programs that perform tasks that previously required human intelligence and attention, but there's nothing really new about that. Plowing a straight furrow uh, used to be a matter of considerable human experience and skill, yet today no one marvels at the ability of a tractor to do the same thing. More contemporary example, painting natural looking hair used to be a skill honed through years of practice and apprenticeship by our most talented artists. But today, nobody blinks an eye when, when Disney uses CGI rendering to uh, animate Rapunzel's flowing hair. Now both of those advances are better understood as progress in automation, not as recreation of human intelligence. We can program machines to solve very complex problems, and we can program them to operate with great in independence. But to call this a simulated form of human intelligence is little more than a fantasy. So my point's simple. Lots of problems that we think require intelligence don't. There are other ways to solve them, and that's what we're using machines to do. OK. Now, I hope you can give me my perspective just for a few minutes, and let me talk about what that means in terms of the social uh, impact and economic impact that these things are going to have. Uh, it's certainly true that artificial intelligence is going to have a serious impact on labor markets and employment, but perhaps not in the way that you expect. If you think of machines as becoming ever more intelligent and threatening our livelihoods, the obvious solution is to uh, prevent them from getting smarter, to lock our doors and arm ourselves with tasers. And you see stuff like this even among AI community. You know, we've got to stop this research. This is dangerous. These things are going to get loose. Well, i got news for you. The robots are coming. Uh, but they aren't exactly uh, coming for our jobs. Uh, machines and computers actually don't perform jobs. This is misunderstood. What they do is they automate tasks except in the most extreme cases. You don't roll in a robot and show an employee here to the door. Instead, the new technology hollows out and changes the jobs that people perform. Now, even experts spend most of their time doing mundane, repetitive tasks, like reviewing lab test results or drafting contracts or writing press releases, filling out paperwork, forms, and things like that. On the blue collar side, you've got lots of workers who drive cars, load trucks, pack boxes, take blood samples, fight fires, deliver mail, direct traffic. And many of those intellectual and physical tasks require straightforward logic or simple hand-eye coordination. And the new technologies, mainly driven by advances in AI, it's a different top, different talk, are poised to automate a lot of these kinds of tasks. Now, if your job involves a narrow, well-defined set of duties, as many do, then indeed your employment is at risk. If you have a broader set of responsibilities, or if, you, if your job requires some kind of human touch, uh, such as expressing sympathy or providing companionship, I don't think that you really have much to worry about. Check out this comparison of bricklayers lay bricks. That's what they do. You can build a machine and lay bricks. Licensed practical nurses, I, this, I got this off an official list of their duties, ensuring patients and their families understand release instructions, providing emotional support. Most jobs require a mix of general capabilities and specific skills, 
And as the machines can perform more routine activities, the plain fact is that fewer people are needed to get those particular jobs done. So one person's productivity enhancing tool is another's pink slip, or more likely, a job opening that doesn't need to get filled. There's this big false debate between whether we're making people more productive or whether we're putting people out of work. These are potential future headlines that capture that. New York Times, they might say, robots steal jobs at record pace. And the Wall Street Journal might look at the same data and say, profits rise as worker productivity soars. <laughs> OK, now um, economists call this process of the hollowing out of these jobs and the changing the jobs structural unemployment. Automation, whether it's driven by artificial intelligence or not, changes the skills that are necessary to perform the work. You know, if the oncologist no longer needs to read uh, MRIs or the accountant operates a computer program instead of doing their calculations, which they used to do by hand, you have different aptitudes, different talents, and different training that might be required. So this is what they call structural or technical unemployment. It's the mismatch of skills that are needed by employers to the actual skills of the workforce. So the more pressing problem posed by artificial intelligence for workers is not so much a lack of jobs, but the way new technology transforms the nature of work and therefore the training that's required to perform those jobs. Now, it's helpful to look at these, this problem dynamically. Historically, as automation has eliminated the need for workers, the resulting increase in wealth has eventually generated all kinds of new jobs to take up the slack. And I see no reason why this won't continue. But the key word there is eventually. Let me give you some data. It's very helpful to look at this dynamically. 200 years ago, more than 90% of the US population worked in agriculture. Basically, all, almost all anybody ever did was grow and prepare food. The stuff you see on Downton Abbey, that was a tiny little sliver of the, of the population. L today, less than 2% of the population is required to feed everybody. Oh my god, is everybody out of work? Of course not. <laughs> but we've had plenty of time to adapt. And as our standard of living has relentlessly increased, which I'm going to get to in a minute, New opportunities have always arisen for people to fill the ever-expanding expectations of our ever-richer society. Now, try to this on for size. Imagine you were a person, or an average person in the 1800s, we time-traveled them to today. They would think we'd all gone nuts. Why not work a few hours a week, buy a sack of potatoes and a jug of wine, build a shack in the woods, dig a hole for an outhouse, and live a life of leisure? That's what they would think. So somehow, however, our rising expectations seem to magically keep pace with our wealth. So you might say, well, OK, what, what's going to happen next? What are these jobs tomorrow? Now, contrary to what you might think about the end of work or robots doing everybody's jobs, it turns out that there are many, many current and a lot, going to be a lot more future jobs that simply can't be automated. They inherently involve a personal touch or a demonstration of skill or person-to-person -person interaction. I don't see why we can't become a society of competitive gamers, of artisans, of personal shoppers, of flower arrangers, of tennis pros, of party planners, and no doubt a lot of other things that don't exist yet at all. I mean, nobody wants to go to a robotic undertaker who says, I am so sorry for your loss. It doesn't work. So who's going to do the real work? You might ask. Well, our great-grandchildren may think our idea of real work is so 21st century. I won't be around, but a lot of you guys will. It may only take 2% of the population, assisted by some pretty remarkable automation, to accomplish what takes 90% of our labor today. The jobs you guys have may not be there. So, our, so what? That's the historical pattern, and it's likely to continue in the future. Now, our expectations keep rising, like my mythical 1800s person out in the woods. Today, here's some weird facts. It's really fun. It's great we have the internet. It makes it easy to pop up crazy stuff. Today, 70% of the people in the US take a shower every day. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands. <laughs> uh, but in 1900, the average was once a week. That was the old normal. 
Now, it may be as important to our grandchildren to have fresh flowers in the house every day as it is to us to shower every day. That's the kind of change in expectations that we're talking about. And two of my kids uh, just got their first jobs. And I couldn't help but notice that their chosen professions didn't exist 10 years ago. One does social media promotion for restaurants. And the other one, you guys will know what this is, it works at Udacity, an online education company. So that's the good news. But there's bad news. The bad news is it takes time for these transitions to happen. And a new wave of AI-enabled applications is likely to accelerate the normal cycle of job destruction and creation. So we have to find new ways to, re to retrain displaced workers. And we don't have the right mechanisms to do that today. So I've written a book. So in the book, I talk about what kinds of things we need to do. Well, one of them is the idea, I just call it a job mortgage. It's not new to me. There's been a history of talking about this, but I framed it a little bit differently. Basically, people should be able to learn new skills by borrowing against their, their future earnings capacity. Uh, today, uh, vocational training in the US is really messed up. This is all in the book. Uh, mainly because the government is the lender of first resort uh, for the student loans, and the skills that people learn are disconnected from the needs, immediate needs of the marketplace. So we're not investing in education. We're handing out money to people to learn things that won't help them to pay that money back. If you can't get a job, too bad. Your student loan is still due. We need to fix that. We need to create new financial instruments that tie the deployment of capital to the return on investment, just as we do with home mortgages. And the history of that is also in the book. Very interesting. That was created, and it doubled home ownership in the US by creating special kinds of financial instruments. Um, we can use the discipline of the marketplace to help us productively repurpose displaced workers. And that not only benefits the ones who find their skills obsoleted, like you programmers, but uh, society in general. It's good for us. Now, finally, there's one more dark cloud related to advances in artificial intelligence. While it's true that automation makes society richer, there are very serious questions about whose pockets are going to be filled by that increased wealth. Now, we live, we, those of us in high tech, uh, tend to believe we're developing dazzling technologies for a needy and grateful world. And indeed, we've made tremendous progress on raising the standard of living for the very poorest of the poor around the world. But for the developed world, the news is not so good. Many of you may know that up until around 1970, on and off, we found ways to distribute at least some of these economic benefits of increased productivity broadly across society. And this supported the rise of this mythical uh, middle class. But it doesn't take much to see, and economists are lamenting the fact that those days are over. As uh, economists know, automation is the substitution of capital for labor. And I'm here to tell you, Karl Marx was right. He was an economist. The struggle between capital and labor is a losing proposition for the workers. What that means is that the benefits of automation naturally accrue to those who can invest, invest in new systems. And why not? People aren't really working any harder than they used to. And frankly, we're not really smarter than people used to be. In fact, interesting fact is that working hours have actually decreased on average slowly but pretty consistently over the last 100 years. It used to be normal to work an 80-hour week in the early 1800s. Um, the reason we can do uh, more with less is that the business owners invest some of their capital into the process and productivity improvements and it makes sense under our economic system that they get the rewards. So what has all this got to do with AI? Is Hal Berrien on there? No. This is some of your greatest hits. You're all your friends. The technologies that are on the drawing boards and are in the labs here at Google are quickening the hearts of entrepreneurs and investors and business owners everywhere. And because they're the ones that stand to benefit. While they're able to export more and more risks to the rest of society, and workers become less secure, wages stagnate, pension funds go bust, we're raising a generation of contractors for the gig economy whose variable working hours and health benefits are their problem. We need to fix that. Now, some people, if you're following the latest political debates, if you've watched any of the Republican debates, horrifies me. 
they have, people have the mistaken impression that the free market is going to address these problems. If only we can get the government out of the way. Well, I'm here to tell you, our economy is hardly an example of unfettered capitalism. And believe me, I've been a beneficiary of that. The fact is there are all sorts of rules and policies that drive where the capital goes, how it's deployed, who gets the returns. It's out of whack. And the problem is that our economic and regulatory policies have become decoupled from our social goals. And we have to fix that. But how do we do that? OK. Now, as with the labor markets, it's helpful to look at this problem dynamically. If you just look at it today, you think, well, we've got to raise taxes, take the money away from the rich people, give it to poor people. That's not necessarily the case. The good news is that the economy isn't <coughs> static. It actually doubles, the GNP doubles, every 40 years. And it's done that pretty reliably since the start of the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. Here's some more weird facts from the internet. In 1800, can anybody guess what the average, average household, household annual income was in the US? 1800, average annual household income in the US. Anybody want to venture a guess? $300. Exactly. Guy, I, a, people actually get this right. When the people in the front, it's interesting. Ones in the front get it right. Ones in the back are on their phones, you know, checking their mail. Um, it was $1,000. That's an inflation-adjusted figure. This isn't some kind of old greenbacks you know, in the gold standard. We're talking about $1,000. Um, now, that's about the same as it is today in Malawi and Mozambique. And it's probably not coincidental that their economies, the structure of their economies, looks surprisingly similar to what it was in the US 200 years ago. So I doubt that people in Ben Franklin's time thought of themselves as dirt poor that they were barely scratching out in existence. Now, what does this mean? That 40 years from now, most likely, there will literally be twice as much wealth to go around. And the challenge for us is to implement policies that are going to encourage that wealth to be more broadly distributed. We don't have to steal from the rich and give to the poor. We need to provide proper incentives for entrepreneurs and businesses to find ways to benefit an ever wider swath of society as opposed to their stockholders and themselves. Now, in my book, available in bookstores everywhere, available in back there, um, I give at least one example, and it's just an example, of the kind of thinking I believe we, we should do to solve this problem. Let me give you an idea. I suggest that we make corporate taxes progressive based on how broadly distributed a company's equity is. So the more stockholders a company has, which is suitably defined, and I do so in the book, um, the lower the tax rate that that company has. Microsoft, you may not know, has one of the most broadly distributed uh, stockholder bases in the world. Uh, Bechtel, anybody know Bechtel? Heard of Bechtel? Okay. I, I think it's still owned by one family. It's a couple of people. It's a huge corporation. Now, if we do this, the, the companies that have the lower tax rate have an advantage in the marketplace. And believe me, these people are going to figure out how to distribute the wealth more widely in order to maximize the, the return for the corporation. It's another talk I could give. We're going to run out of time here. It's very interesting. But we used to give away assets in the United States when we were an agrarian economy. In an agrarian economy, assets were land. And if you worked the land for seven years, you got it for free. The government literally gave it away. Now, today, uh, the total value by my uh, research of all the real estate in the United States, I think it's 17% of our assets. Mostly, we have financial instruments. So the idea of giving away money suitably used for productive purposes is not at all unreasonable and not without historical uh, uh, Historical precedent, thank you. Um, so I believe that progressive policies like this can promote our social goals without stifling economic growth. We just have to get on with it and stop believing the myth that unfettered capitalism is the answer to the world's problems. OK, so let me wrap up. I don't want you to think that I'm anti-AI. Nothing is further from the truth. I think its potential impact on the world is similar and I'm not exaggerating, to the invention of the wheel, or possibly to the steam engine. But 
we need to think of it not as some kind of magical discontinuity in the development of intelligent life on Earth, but rather as a powerful collection of automation tools with the potential to transform our livelihoods and to vastly increase our wealth. You know, the challenge we face is that our existing institutions, without some enlightened rethinking, run a serious risk of making a mess out of this opportunity. I'm supremely confident that our future is very bright, more Star Trek than Terminator. But the transition may be protracted and brutal unless we pay attention to the issues that I've raised today. We have to find new and better ways to ensure that our economy doesn't just motor on going faster and faster while throwing ever more people overboard to increase its speed. Our technology and our economy should serve us, not the other way around. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for that talk. I have to say, I agreed with almost everything you said. Oh, no. I'm not sure I'm such a good discussant. Maybe we should, let's take a question or two from the audience. Yes. Uh, Hi. Uh, you mentioned job mortgages, and the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, indentured servitude when mm -hmm. I think of that. So like, how do you draw the line uh, you know, necessarily between the two? Well, the word mortgage, a uh, little known fact, comes from the French. It means pay until death. Mortgage. That's what it means. I'm serious about that. Um, the answer, of course, is you take out a loan, you have to pay it back uh, if we simply tie the loan to your future income so that we limit it. And there is a lot of activity going on for student loans today. The US government has a bunch of programs where you, know, you can defer payments. Uh, it depends on how much you make. Um, then uh, I think we can do it without it becoming indentured servitude as such. Uh, it's just better than what we've got, which is it's, it, you, you work and you've you got to pay the man regardless of whether you have the income to do it. They did do uh, something like this at Yale 20 or 25 years mm -hmm. ago, where you could take out a loan stuff. and pay back in equity. So I would pay back 5% of my adjusted gross income. Or you could take it out the loan and pay back a fixed amount. So you got a debt or equity choice. The trouble is, there was a serious adverse selection problem that all the people that are going to high income jobs took the debt contract, and all the people that were going into, let's say, humanities or uh, less well paying <laughs> tasks took the equity. So they were certainly sharp enough to uh, recognize the difference. So it is a little tricky uh, when you design these, uh, these financial contracts. And for some reason, we made the student loans non dischargeable in bankruptcy Correct. for totally. the same sort of reason yeah. because the smart thing to do would be to graduate, immediately go bankrupt because you have no income. Then you remove that obligation and then go out and get a job. So it's tricky because of people are responding to the incentives you said in terms of the financial contract. I, I agree with that. The, the thing to bear in mind, though, is I think these are all solvable problems. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're just issues that need to be addressed in some way. Mortgages, as you probably know, are non-recourse loans. And that was the key. It was tied to the property. Now, somebody who's going to loan you the money for your house, now they care about what that house is worth. If, if it was the other way around, they, you can buy any house you want. I don't care what it's worth, and we'll loan you the money and you're on the hook, it would be a very different world. So, and there are many steps in between. Well, I, th I think part of the problem is that you don't have the same due diligence standards for handing out education loans as you do for mortgages. There's a serious question of whether you're giving these loans in cases where they probably could be forecast, they wouldn't pay off. And it's very hard to do that when they're government subsidized because then you're saying, oh, you're treating these people different than those treat people and so on. There was actually just a, a piece in the, uh, either the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times in the, in the last week about that, uh, that exact topic, that maybe we should use more, disc d use more diligence in awarding the student loans in the first place. And of course, that's the way it used to be. When I was in college, I got loans from the university, but the university knew I was a pretty good uh, bet. Well, Other questions? Here, la over here. All right, thanks for coming. Um, you, you were pointing the finger at the general public for, for not understanding the, the limitations of artificial intelligence, but I'm not so sure it's just the, the general public. I think the, this idea might be unwelcome even among people who work in software development or work in artificial intelligence. My question for you is, how unpopular is this a, a message 
even for people who work in artificial intelligence? Well, I, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I've only given the talk or versions of this a few times. And usually what happened, happened up at uh, Google and Kirkland, you know, I had about a third of the audience going, yeah, that's, that's right, you know, that's, type of, you know, this guy's Donald Trump, he's telling the truth, you know? <laughs> and, you know, other people are just kind of, hmm, well, you know. If somebody comes in and says, you are working on the most important thing in the world, this is the future of evolution. You are going to build machines and we're going to upload our minds. And uh, it, it, this is a, uh, there's a wonderful book called Apo Apocalyptic AI that is fantastic and nobody has read it by a religious historian talking about the history of apop apocalyptic ideas in uh, Judeo-Christian societies. And then he maps that onto this and he, he went to Carnegie Mellon and interviewed everybody. And I mean, I'm, I'm arguing against the soothsayer who promises eternal life and salvation. I'm not expecting you to get very far by saying, that's nonsense, you're going to die. But uh, I think that a sensible person, particularly those working in the field, they look at what you're doing. Think about what you're doing. And do you really feel, just because there's some guy telling you, you know, this is the most important thing since sliced bread, that, uh, you know, do you believe that? Or is it just dressing up? And I think it's just dressing up. This is, if they hadn't called it, I had to take this out of the talk. The term artificial intelligence is what caused the problem. It started in 1958 by John McCarthy. Any of you guys know John McCarthy? Know who he is, at least? Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. I did that at Stanford. Only like a third of the graduate students in computer science knew who John McCarthy was. Now, John McCarthy invented the term. And he did it as a reaction against Norbert Wiener, who had cybernetics. And he didn't want to be known as cybernetics, so he came up with the term. Now, John was an interesting guy. He's a mathematician. But he had the greatest inadvertent marketing coup in history by coming up with that term. It has driven all of this media and all of this. If he just called it logic programming, which is what he meant by it, by the way, back then, which has been discredited as a basis for artificial intelligence, you know, we wouldn't be in this room today, and I wouldn't be spending my time trying to, to promote these ideas. So, so one thing you said that I thought was very important is this distinction between jobs and tasks. And as you know, from the Department of Labor, there is this massive listing of job titles and tasks. I yes. think your yeah, nurse's example was yeah. taken from there. You can look this up online. And so people have gone through this, some people at Oxford and actually McKinsey is going through it now and trying to identify which tasks are automatable. Uh, now, what happens, of course, if you're in a job where there are only a few automatable tasks, that's great for you because the, the automation complements your services. You can do more of these other things and less of these tedious, uh, unpleasant tasks. But on the other hand, if you're in a job where almost all your tasks in that job are automatable, like the brick bricklayer example, uh, in fact, then, of course, you're not in such good shape. So the challenge is to look both at the fraction of tasks or the number of tasks in your job description that are automatable, and uh, that's going to give you a clue of whether the technology is going to function as a complement to your job or as a substitute for it. So McKinsey's working on this, and yeah. it'll be out in a few weeks. Yeah, the, the McKinsey report sounds like it's going to be great. I've <clears throat> seen some summaries of it. The Fran yeah. Osborne study from Oxford is terribly flawed. Yeah. I actually had dinner with them two weeks ago. Yeah. I, I looked at it, it seemed to me it was, uh, their methodology wasn't uh, very clearly described. And uh, I think the McKinsey guys, I'm urging them to make their work reproducible so that you could, you know, there could be other opinions offer, offered on, uh, on what tasks are really automatable. But a great example of how science doesn't proceed scientifically, or this debate doesn't, uh, the uh, Oxford study uh, by uh, Fran Osborne uh, had a number in it, in the title. It said 47% of yes. jobs yeah. will be automatable in the next 20 years. Right. Well, maybe they're right or wrong, that got it totally, total play from, uh, from Oxford. So it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I have to agree with, with Hal completely on this. It's, it's about task automation. Now, there are two, two things that have happened in AI. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Jeez. There are recent advances Sorry. that really are going to affect the tasks that can be automated. The first of them is machine learning, which allows us to take certain kind of perceptual tasks and convert that information into actionable uh, symbolic form. And uh, the second is uh, basic robotics of being able to move things around, but now to control that, 
using the information that we can get in from sensors. So a great deal of blue collar tasks are going to be automatable. That's what's going to happen. And a great deal of uh, intellectual tasks, like writing dumb press releases, uh, you know, are, are going to be automatable as well. So my, my basic point, which I didn't really make in the talk, is I think this is going to accelerate over the next 20 or 30 years, and it's going to be a big problem. I'm not against doing it. It's great. Automation is good. It just has some negative side effects, and we need to deal with those. Uh, so we have seen prominent academics, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, uh, Bill Gates, uh, speak out against artificial intelligence. And I think they're really speaking out not against narrow intelligence, things like Watson, uh, but related to artificial or general purpose learning, general purpose learning algorithms, uh, things like DeepMind, Vicarious. Uh, what do you see to be their greatest argument for you know, being worried about artificial intelligence, and how would you refute it? Well, the, the problem is what you're really talking about is a tweet from Stephen Hawking. It's just, this is the problem with the way science and society proceeds. He's very prominent. He's well known. He puts out a tweet, everybody. And you can interpret it multiple ways. Um, I, I was at Oxford where a guy actually said to me, it was worth 15 seconds, it was worth the trip out there just because the guy looked me in the eye and he said to me, I wasn't going to be able to make your talk, but my dinner with Stephen Hawking was canceled. <laughs> That was worth a trip to England, have somebody say that to me. Um, I mean, my reaction is, great mind, great man. I'm not going to argue with him about radiation from black holes. I don't think he should be arguing with the people who are here doing artificial intelligence. And they're hearing it from each other. It's a big echo chamber. I mean, not that they don't have something to say. Uh, and there is arguments on the other side, but it's just I heard somebody say this, and it's, it's true. Worrying about superintelligence, worrying about the threat of AI, it's like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. You know, we're just about maybe going to be able to get a man on Mars, despite the film. <laughs> and uh, why are we worrying about this? It's sucking the oxygen out of the debates that we really need to be having about what's really going on and what kind of societal problems these things are going to cause in your lifetime. You know, we shouldn't be spending the time and energy on it. I'm fine with academics going to conferences and having talks about this. But, you know, we got to get the gee whiz out of artificial intelligence. When it starts to show up, that's great. I would say, uh, am I, I, I differ slightly because I don't think it's so much the artificial intelligence component, but there, there are technologies um, that have, let's say, military use or offensive use that, of course, will be more broadly available, just like mobile phones are more broadly available. So, uh, drones that deliver bombs will be available. And so there's questions. That would be the threat that most worries me of kind of um, homemade, small-scale attacks of one sort or another using technology. I, I don't know that there's a lot we can do about that, but but it's except better build better defenses against such such things. But I, I think that is a concern. Technology makes people more powerful, and the people it makes more powerful may be good guys or bad guys. So it's going to escalate. Yeah, I, you know Stuart Russell has yeah, worked. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, now I, I don't always agree with him, but he's he's at least he's trying. That would be my point of view. And this goes back to your question. If what you mean by AI is dangerous is the robots are going to become sentient and take over the world, forget it. Not, not relevant at all. But that's not to say that technology cannot be dangerous and represent real threats to real people. And this is very scary because what's happening, and Stuart, I think, when he's giving in-depth talks rather than saying that the robots are coming, what he talks about is that the price of the access and price of some of these technologies that can have mass destructive power. Um, it used to be, or is now, confined to very big, hopefully responsible players like the United States. But that may not be the case in 10 years. You know, the, you can build little drones that will run around, you know, recognize people and inject some poison in their eye when they're sleeping. I mean, that's the kind of crazy stuff that can happen. And, you know, with some despot or, you know, crazy whack terrorist types, you know, get a hold of that technology. It can be very dangerous. So there's a right. huge debate going on. If you, if you can deliver pizza by drones, you can deliver bombs by drones. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. And uh, there's a very big debate going on inside the military. And at the UN, there's a standing council on this. And there's uh, a lot of philosophers and technology experts. You know, th that sort of, they're really trying to grapple with this. 
But it's like the biotechnology thing. I would use that as an analogy. It's very dangerous, much more dangerous than the AI stuff. And you guys have probably heard of the CRISPR Cas9 stuff. I mean, you know, it's, they're trying to deal with that. You know, what are the ethics of this? What's OK to do? How much development? What kind of labs do we need? We'll have to do the same thing in artificial intelligence. So um, I guess uh, the first thing is that I never really understood why people always treat technological advancement that improves productivity as, um, as something that threatens jobs. Because if someone can produce more of something in the same time, it basically <coughs> could also mean that we can all have more of that same thing, and everybody would be better off. Right? And then my second point uh, of my question, I guess, is um, so do you think that the increase in um, wealth disparity is related to the influence of money on politics and how the accumulation of wealth, which could then be used to impact politics, is a self-exacerbating cycle? And that, therefore, the solution would be to kind of crowdfund politics in some sense to democratize it again. Well, I'm, I'm sure Hal could probably do a better job than I can, but I'm the here, speech. so I'm the speaker. So, <laughs> um, on on the uh, the first point was uh, relating to I can remember one thing at a time. Productivity. Yeah, it's a complicated equation. Uh, the automation makes people more productive. That means you need fewer of them. Uh, but uh, it takes a, a certain amount of time. It's like a cycle. It's estimated at 10 to 15 years that there's process re-engineering. And the money, that the new wealth that's created goes out into society. And society um, uh, then creates new jobs, often in different places. That's, so it's, it's the lag that creates the problem. It puts people out of work in the short run. In the long run, it creates more wealth and generates a lot more new jobs. Uh, your second point, um, sorry, didn't get much. Money in politics. In my opinion, absolutely. It's completely ridiculous. People look at Iran and say, why, this is terrible. The Ayatollah has to prove everybody who runs for office. Why would we have a system like that? Well, we have the same system here. If you can't get the, the, a very small group of very wealthy people, it's like 150 families, I think was in the New York Times, uh, to, to support you, you can't run for office. So that's a gate that's, that's very sadly uh, has been uh, put in place. And my opinion is, you call it crowdfunding, but they used to have a checkoff box. So I don't even they still have that for presidential campaigns. Absolutely, we need to get the money. You don't have to get it out of politics. You have to have it reduce its influence. And it's an obvious reason why the people who are getting elected uh, uh, take the point of view to do the things that benefit the wealthy. Let's uh, thank you again for coming, and uh, be signing books in the back. Very nice. Oh, thank you. Sir. Thank you.